In order for construction of the new Connecticut Center for Science and Exploration to take place, the site first had to be surveyed and drilled in order to determine how and when people lived here. Answering those questions is critical to knowing where to dig and to drill and where the building can be located on the site. In addition, the type of soil, location of bedrock, and old building foundations needs to be located and understood. The group called Archaeological and Historical Services was asked to do geoprobes, which are core samples of the soil around the site. The samples are able to provide a timeline as to when recent major events occurred at this location, such as when agriculture became a stable activity at Adrian's Landing. By determining how glacier movement changed the Earth's surface, where the river channel moved, and how the floodplain developed, engineers are able to make informed decisions as to how to design the building foundation for the new science center. Because of the silty floodplain material, piles are the best way to create a foundation for the new building. So let's see what's happened along the Connecticut River over the past few thousand years. Today, we have Ralph Lewis, the former state geologist with us. How are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Can you tell us what's happened along the Connecticut River over the past 20,000 years? I'd be glad to. 20,000 years ago, Connecticut and all of New England was covered by the Wisconsin and Glacier. If you were here then, you would be beneath ice that was about a mile or so thick. The weight of the ice was pushing the land down and the movement of the glacier was smoothing the landscape. At the same time, the glacier was beginning to melt. By 15,000 years ago, most of Connecticut was ice-free and Glacier Lake Hitchcock was expanding from its dam at Rocky Hill. The blue area on this map shows what this glacial lake looked like in the Hartford area. This other map gives a regional view of the lake when it extended from Rocky Hill to Vermont. While Glacier Lake Hitchcock was in existence, thick accumulations of fine sediment were deposited, forming an extensive lake bed that primarily consisted of glacial lake clay, like you see here. Just about like modeling clay. If you can see, I can, I can model it just like it was clay. This is the very fine lake sediment, and you'll notice it's a little bit red because it was being derived from the red rocks in the valley. By 12,400 years ago, the draining of Lake Hitchcock had exposed its large flat lake bed to stream erosion, and the ongoing tilting of the land caused streams to flow and erode faster. The Connecticut River that we know today formed and began to cut a river channel through the Hitchcock Lake bed as it flowed southward to the Sound. As sea level rose in relation to the land, the Connecticut River could no longer flow as fast, and sandy sediment began to fill the channel that was previously cut in the old lake bed. This sediment is about 20 feet thick in the Adrian's Landing area. The upward rebound of the land had waned by about 9,000 years ago, but the sea is still rising. As the land stabilized, vegetation spread along the meandering river's banks, and periodic flooding was building floodplains. The diverse habitats of the floodplain and wetland systems that had developed along the meandering Connecticut River were attractive to the first Native American visitors to the region. By approximately 6,000 years ago, Long-term settlements had been established along the river. A thousand years ago, the environment surrounding the river was fairly stable and flooding had decreased. Maize, beans, and squash were introduced as the first Native American farmers established themselves on the fertile floodplain soils in the Hartford area. Over the next 600 years, floods became more common again, which corresponds with the arrival of the first European settlers. Archaeologists are able to chart the river from 1620 and its changing channels and the effect on agriculture, land use, and town boundaries. By 1837, the river had changed its path and created property issues in the state. Farmers either lost land or added land depending on the movement of the meandering river. Between 1800 and 1900, Vermont and New Hampshire forests were clear cut, which exposed huge amounts of topsoil that made its way into the river. Much of the soil was deposited between Hartford and Middletown. The river continues to migrate except at Adrian's Landing, where bedrock protects the site from erosion and the Hockenham River Delta holds the river channel in its current position. The Connecticut River will continue to meander across its floodplain, and anything built along the banks of the river, particularly here at Adrian's Landing, would be susceptible to flooding if it were not for the dikes and levees. Interstate 91 is part of the system that holds back the water during the spring thaw and rainy seasons. 
Remember, the sea is still rising and the Connecticut River system is so flat that the tidal influence from Long Island Sound is felt here in Hartford. If current trends persist long enough, Adrian's Landing may eventually be a saltwater port. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. As you've seen, erosion and glaciers have played a major part in forming the Connecticut River Valley. This in turn determines the way the Connecticut Center for Science and Exploration is built. After the more than 500 piles are driven into the ground, pile caps will be created upon which the concrete foundation for the building is poured and the parking garage is erected. We will explore these topics in upcoming episodes. But for now, here are excellent websites to continue your research on the formation of the Connecticut River Valley and the Long Island Sound. Thank you to the following organizations and individuals for their help.